how's your uh how's your daughter doing she's doing pretty well thank you for asking we we went down as you know in february actually the week that we launched the podcast and the week you got hit by a cement truck literally (laughs) all of that that day was insane man so we thought we were going down for one little procedure for, for my daughter who's 10 and we thought it would be pretty straightforward, but we got there, we got everything checked out, and they said, hey, look, we got to do two procedures. So we did procedure number one, and it went well, but with some complications. So we, we tried to go home, and, well, she had a dramatic manifestation of those symptoms. She started puking blood like the exorcist, dude. You can just say it. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't like me to say it. She's embarrassed about that. Because gotcha. that happened at a continental breakfast at a hotel in front of a whole lot of paying patrons who I think were disappointed to have that be a part of their yeah. continental breakfast. So we yeah, had to hustle that, back to, to the hospital and a whole bunch of more things happened. It was a very, very maximum stressful day. That's a hard thing to watch your kid go through. So we get done and I just got to take the other kids out and grab a bite to eat. So I jump in the car with my buddy Adam and we pull out onto Colfax Avenue in Denver. We go literally one block from the hospital, and I'm just starting to exhale because I'm out of that stressful situation, and we literally got hit by a cement truck. That was the best phone call ever. Cause, cause, you <laughs> how know, you, how were, do you remember it? Well, you were you know, giving me updates on, dude, this happened. Oh, my gosh, she's puking blood. We're three hours away from Denver. We're turning around, and we're going back. And then everything was just, oh, my house flooded. Everything bad was happening. And so all your friends were trying to help you in various different ways. And you call me, you're like, yeah, so we got hit by a cement truck. And I was like, yeah, man, I know. It's been a really hard day. <laughs> That's exactly how you said it. No, I freaking just got hit by a cement truck. <laughs> no, like there's glass all over us. It exploded the back end of the vehicle. I'm sitting on Colfax Avenue with my with my little kids here. And this guy's in That was the day we launched this podcast, man. It is. That was the very day. Well, I recorded, yeah. there, there's a little video on my 10 Minute Bible Hour YouTube channel where I'm walking out of Children's Hospital in the elevator telling people that we're launching the podcast. Mm-hmm. I went from there into the vehicle, pulled out of the parking lot, and got hit by the cement truck. That's awesome. So all that happened back in the past, but now you're to the point where you had to do surgery number two. And did it go okay? Yeah, those people are wizards. There's a reason that hospital has the reputation it does. They're great with families. They're great with kids. They nailed it. Um, everything went as it was supposed to go. Did a couple days of recovery in the hospital, got out of there, got home. And it's fun to see the little girl's personality rebounding after all of that stress and trauma. And it's fun to see her starting to, to heal up and feel excitement about what got done in the procedure. And so that's awesome. Yeah, she is doing well, and it's it's. I've missed her. It's been a couple of months of her being really nervous, knowing this thing was coming down the pike, and she's just flowering as a person again. So, yep, that that's that awesome, gets man. to my squishy I'm, daddy parts, but I'm excited about it. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, now that we have all that stuff out of the way, and and I've checked in on you emotionally, I think I'm just going to slap you upside the head with a question I've been dying to ask you. Are you cool with that? Fire away. Are you ready for this question? I don't know until I hear it. You're like the most libertarian person I know, right? Thanks. What do you do as a libertarian about North Korea? With our government or myself? Like, <laughs> like what do I go do about it? No, like, what has to happen with North Korea? What do we do? What do you mean, has to happen? Why does anything have to happen? I mean, what, what's going on there that requires whatever it is you're imagining we ought to do. Oh, cool. So you're a pacifist. You think we should just chill and do nothing? I'm pacifist-ish. I stumped you, didn't I? I'm trying to give you something to shoot at, but really my take would be until they do more, nothing. I'm a huge fan of nothing. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, what am I missing? Is Have they invaded somewhere? So you think we just draw a border around North Korea and just let them be there? Like the rest of the world can let them do whatever they want? They're shooting missiles into the ocean, Matt. Are the missiles working yet? What does it matter? Well, it matters a tremendous amount. If somebody on an island is like, hey, I made missiles, and they just sort of lob them out into their own water, and not much comes of it, I'm not ready to shed blood over that. 
if the missiles are working and they're actively ready to engage with those missiles, well, then maybe it's a different conversation if threat is imminent. Now, I'm asking you, do you think it's imminent? Okay. I have asked the question, Mr. Libertarian, what do you do about North Korea? And you're going to sit there and you're going to try to hide behind the, well, they've not done anything. The missiles aren't working. Well, one day the missiles are going to work, Matt. Right. And that's, that's the day that maybe you start thinking about doing something. Really? So here's the thing. The last 150 years of American history, we've been at war more than anybody else, or we've engaged violently more often than anybody else in the world, any other nation. Dude, I'm really sorry to have to interrupt you, but you know my Dagobah Aquarium? Yeah. One of the Tetras, the little adorable cardinal Tetras, the ones you can just see jumped out of the water and slammed against the side of the tank and is stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I've never seen this before. I've stared at this tank Take for seven years. Pictures didn't There's happen. a fish. Just, I mean, pull this up. He wiggled off. Okay. He wiggled off. Is he good? It was a miracle and it was magical and I needed to tell you right that second. The fish jumped up on top of the aquarium and he couldn't get off? No, well, my aquarium is a vivarium. I don't know what they call it, but it's something. So it just has water in the bottom. It's got a bunch of live stuff up above. Mm -hmm. And so it jumped out of the water against the the part of the glass that is above the water line, and it just stuck there. And it was just kind of laying there, squiggling, suspended vertically <laughs> against the glass. And I guess it wiggled enough oh. and it got to go back down. It was really sad. Cohesion? Like it stuck to the glass? Yeah, it just stuck there. <laughs> it was just like... It's like it's like if you put a fish in a plastic bag and then drained all the water out, it looked like that, just <laughs> dead and pathetic, and then it just broke loose. I mean, good for you, man. That's awesome. It's go fish. Good you're, he's fine now. He's yeah, he's, he's fine now. It it worked out in the end. How do you monitor the smoke level in there? Okay, so I've got some kind of ultrasonic thing that turns the, the water into this cool mist that hovers just above the water line. Uh huh. But it all depends on how far below the water line that device is. Yeah. So if I've got a lot of evaporation going on, then it comes down and then you lose the smoke. But you can get it to a certain point where it's just ideal and it fills that thing up. But it's like an electromechanical device that you put down in the water and kind of shakes the water in ultrasonic frequency and makes vapor? Yeah, I assume it's injuring the fish and that they absolutely hate it and that they can hear it because they hear sounds I don't. But visually, it's really pleasing. (laughs) So I'm going to keep doing it. Also, there's a plastic Mattel X-Wing fighter. partially submerged in my aquarium, which I'm told is emitting toxins that are also murdering my fish. But they seem happy. I mean, it's not like they're jumping out for the... Oh, well. Yeah, that that wasn't very funny. I I guess one of them's trying to get out. What do you do about North Korea? That's a complicated question. Well, there's a lot of things you could do, and most of the things that countries try to do in those kinds of moments get weird. I mean, especially if you're talking about military intervention, which I'm not a big fan of. So I I suppose there are a lot of little things that you can do. But I tell you, the very first thing that I would change would be I would drop the sanctions against North Korea and let them back into the game. By all accounts, life there is pretty rough. So what if you started trading with them again? Well, not too many people want to blow up people who they're actively trading with and making a lot of money off of because then you don't get to trade with them anymore. You're joking, right? No, I'm not joking. Like I would back off the sanctions and see what you could do about getting them back into the game economically. What? Yeah, that's actually what I think. It's cool that it sounds like well, you're I... offended. No, 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 no. You've got a population that's completely isolated from the rest of the world, and there's no conversation going on. There's no reason for the people of North Korea to give a rip about things that are going on outside because they're isolated from everything that's going on outside and don't appreciate what their role could be in that. So generally, when you're not talking to people, it's easier to not like those people and want to want to do damage to them. So I've been trying to think of ways that you could incentivize North Korea to like the rest of the world more. Now, I don't know if that'll make leaders come around. That's hard to say. Well, I, I think you're making an assumption that if we just lift sanctions on North Korea, then all of a sudden they're going to start communicating with us. And I, I don't think you're right about that at all. I mean, you're talking about a guy that doesn't let the internet happen in his country. I mean, that's... What, what exactly do you think is going to happen? You, you think it's going to be like, hey, no sanctions. Yeah, but people like money. People super like Listen. money. It's one thing that almost all people have in common. And right now stuff is pretty bad by all accounts in North Korea. 
So I don't trust the family that's been in charge of North Korea since whatever it was, 1955-ish. I don't trust them at all. They've done awful things. I'd rather not see them be in power. I just also don't think this is one of those situations that we can kill our way out of. We've tried that policy in places. It seems like the thing that has really won the big victories in the last 150 years of foreign policy has been getting people to the table and participating in making things better with them, even if they have leaders who are stupid and difficult. I mean, we're trying that with Cuba right now, right? We're backing off a half a century policy of isolating them. Well, Castro died. The leader that was doing the crazy stuff left. And by left, I mean died. So... I mean, I, I think you're assuming that I think you're assuming that things are just going to magically get better if you lift sanctions. We're talking about people who are developing nuclear bombs and they say straight up, hey, we want to bomb your country with our nuclear bombs. I mean, they they were congratulated by Hamas last week <laughs> which is, for for threatening Israel. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's one of those letters that you frame and put up you know, on the wall of your office. Yeah, I, I think you're using logic and reason thanks with a you know someone who's who's proven over the years not to use logic and reason oh it felt like a compliment at first no it wasn't (laughs) thanks for just owning your use of logic is illogical okay here's the thing though why aren't we blowing up saudi arabia and why isn't saudi arabia blowing us up because they're buying a lot of they're buying a lot of military hardware from america well, and there's the oil thing. Well, I mean, more oil comes from North America, but anyway, that's a common misconception. Go ahead. Well, but they participate in the game. Right. And and so them being a part of the game, I'm not just talking about American oil, but them being a part of the economic game with the quote unquote civilized West is how they're getting ridiculously rich. And so it doesn't really benefit Saudi Arabia to come and cause problems and rattle the saber with the West. And it doesn't really benefit the West to do the same thing, even though we really disagree with Saudi Arabia on a ton of stuff. Right wing, left wing, it doesn't matter. We don't like a lot of what Saudi Arabia thinks about things. Is that a fair statement? It is. I I think you're missing the point, though. I I think you're... No, Destin, I think uh, you're missing the (laughs) point. I just wanted to try to ramp it up. I don't... uh, You can go ahead. No, no, I, I think... I think you're misunderstanding my question, or maybe I'm asking it wrong. So the question isn't like, hey, how do you fix this, you know, this entire people group um, just by changing a national policy? Because this is down at the people level. I mean, we're talking about people who like don't eat well because of the policies of their nation and they're brainwashed by, you know, the dictator who they think is, you know, they, they literally think he's a god. Right? Well, I I don't know. I I mean I, I hear people say things like that, but I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 pretty well understood. Like have you have you read anything from people who have defected from North Korea? Have you seen any of that? Yeah, I have. There's this really interesting video that I want you to watch. It has to do with people that have left North Korea and their reaction to like Western food, specifically barbecue. I can tell you about my reaction to Western food, specifically barbecue. What? <laughs> it's it's generally positive. Well, you only eat meat. That's why. You, I don't you only eat, like eat meat. I eat butterfingers. That's not that's not <laughs> meat. I mean, there's probably some meat that ends up in there on accident, but you know, when like I came that. to visit you in where where did we meet that time Salt I Lake. came out there? I was okay when I was at Salt Lake. Oh, I don't even remember what I was there for. It was business, I think. Yeah, you were given a talkie talk at something. That was it. Yeah. When I was there and we went out to eat with your family, I'm not going to lie, I felt a little uncomfortable with how you ate. Wow. Kind of a food judger. It was only meat. You only ate meat. It was kind of strange. That's false. There, I mixed noodles with the meat. That's true. You, how about this? You remember the time we met in Washington, D.C. before the White House thing? Mm-hmm. Do you remember eating at Old Ebbet Grill, that, you know, we, the one fancy meal we've had together? You you only ordered a steak. That's it. And you said no vegetables. Do you remember this? Well, yeah, I, I didn't want the vegetables to accidentally touch the steak because then you'd taste it while you're eating the steak. Anyway, I, I digress. Can, I tell you what, let's address that later in the show. <laughs> I think I have a plan. I'm going to make a phone call. We'll we'll address that later in the show. However, let's get back to North Korea. This this really interesting thing on this video. I mean, it's a long video. It's uh, uh I sent it to you to prep for this for this podcast, but mm-hmm. 
these people eating this barbecue are so surprised that you can just eat that much meat because they never get to have that in North Korea. I mean, they say it was like, you know, they'll get killed for killing a cow or something like that. It's amazing. I mean, that's the kind of squalor these people are living in. I'm not advocating that, you know, we use force in North Korea. But what I do think is there's a a humanitarian issue going on there. I agree. And, you know, at least at least what I'm being told to believe from the media and, you know, the, the people that are fleeing North Korea. So obviously they have a a vested interest in painting a bad picture of North Korea, right? I admit that. Fair. But I think something something strange is happening there. And I think it would be awesome if people were treated fairly, and it doesn't seem to be the case. Now, I I don't want to be Team America World Police and go in there and try to do things, because obviously that's not the right thing to do. That's a documentary about the situation in North Korea for our viewers who aren't familiar with it. (laughs) (laughs) Highly recommend watching that. Thank you, Pastor. So, so <laughs> my point is... Is the theme song in your head right now? It, it, no, it's not. I actually haven't watched that. <laughs> oh, really? But I know the song because m- many people have sung it around me, correct? It's hard not to. Anyway, so here's what I'd like to do. Um, I, I, think, I think what we do is we stop and let's just watch that video, the barbecue uh, video, people from North Korea eating Western-style barbecue and then we'll talk about it a little bit later. But I do want to address your meat issue later. Yeah. Okay. So just to review the structure of this episode. Yeah, let's do that. We're going to cover dumb things Matt thinks about foreign policy. Correct. Then we're going to cover some <laughs> dumb things that Matt thinks about dietary issues. But right, yeah. we did at least get to talk about my daughter doing better. So that's cool. That, yeah. that endeared you to me. You can tell me. you got to pick the topics for today's episode, didn't you? <laughs> By the way, today's sponsor is HelloFresh, which has to do with food, and um, I'm going to try to convince you to use them because it'll make you eat better food. <laughs> is that okay? I'm convincible. I, I, am, I am attempting a sympathetic liquid diet with my daughter, and I've been at this for a few really? days now. Yeah, she, she mm-hmm. well, her surgery was on her throat, and so she's on a pourable diet for a while here, mm. which means that it's really hard for her. So I'm doing one meal a day of solidarity diet of eating just slime that I dumped down my throat. And my wife makes them for me, these smoothies or whatever. Really? She started to tell me what was in them. And I plugged my ears like, no, 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 (laughs) no. If you tell me, I'm going to taste every one of those ingredients. You need to just throw them in there, mix them up. And it's best that I not know. And so far, I have not even gagged a little bit. I'm proud of you. I am proud of you. Thanks, man. Seriously. I'm not just saying that. That's Having eaten several meals with you, that's a big deal. So good job. But when you are off the pourable diet, I want you to eat some better food. So here's how this went down. My wife got this service for us. And so instead of me doing the the, the whole ad thing here in a second, I just busted in on homeschool time and sat down and just asked her about it. It's called HelloFresh. Anyway, so can we go do an ad real quick while people go watch the North Korea barbecue video? Especially this kind of ad. Let's do it. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by HelloFresh, and we don't like ads that are lame, so this is what we did. My wife has demanded that we use HelloFresh. Other people have wanted to sponsor No Dumb Questions, and uh, my wife says it's going to be HelloFresh because I love them. And so this is how I'm doing this. If you go to HelloFresh.com and type in the promo code NDQ30, that's for No Dumb Questions 30, you'll get 30 bucks off your first order. But here's how I did this ad. I just walked into the kitchen where my wife and my son were doing homeschool time because she likes to cook stuff from HelloFresh with my son to teach him how to cook. And I interrupted and just started asking him questions. So the audio quality is not that great on this, but it's 100% real. Check it out. Would you like to explain how this came about? I basically bought myself a subscription for Christmas so I wouldn't have to do as much meal planning or shopping for the new year. And here we are five months later. And other people have uh, asked to support Smarter Every Day, other of these meal planning type things. and Yes, and other meal planning companies have sent us meals, and I did not like the setup or the food options. And so I went back to paying for HelloFresh because I enjoyed it better. Right. And so that's what we do, right? Mm-hmm. So we do, how does it, just explain how it works. I can plan up to a month ahead, and I go online and I say, hey, I want these three of these eight meals this week. 
and then I, I pick all my meals for the, that month. I mean, I can pause the week if we're going to be on travel. And so it shows up in a box with ice on Monday morning and I pull out the the, the boxes for the week. And each little box has every item I need for that meal. So if it's only one clove of garlic, then that's what's in there. You Did know? you know how to do all that stuff before you started cooking? I didn't know how to make sauces and I didn't know how to use fresh herbs properly. So that has been the biggest learning curve just because that has been a fun you know, sauces and, and herbs kind of make the difference. And not that I was making boring food, but I definitely make more fun food now and fresher food. The thing that I really like about it is what, what this little man gets to yeah, do. Yeah, because I can spend five minutes doing prep work, doing all the dicing, and then he can come along and basically cook the whole meal. All right, this is my uh, this is my son. He's eight years old. Do you want to talk? Are, are you okay with me interrupting him at school time? That's fine. Yeah? I'm yeah. going to put the microphone in your face, and I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? Okay. What's the coolest thing you've learned to do in the kitchen? Probably learn how to chop scallops. What? What? How do you... How do you I mean, um, I don't, I don't chop know. scunions. Scunions? <laughs> you mean scallions? Yeah, scallions. <laughs> how, how do you do that? Um, mommy just showed me to chop off the end and then just make it into little circles. So you learn how to use a knife? Yep. Is it pretty rad? Yes, sir. Tell us why we're using HelloFresh. Like, why should you even do this? Like, why should you even... Oh, well, I don't have to... I mean, it's nice for me because I don't have to take four kids shopping to find 12 ingredients for three different meals. And um, the time that it saved was huge. The money, um, when you're only needing one clove of garlic instead of 10, you know, or you're only needing an ounce of vinegar instead of a bottle. You're cool with sending other people to HelloFresh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've loved to HelloFresh. I mean, we've cooked things we never would have cooked. I've, To be honest, I feel like I'm in cooking school. I'm in cooking class each week because I'm learning to cook some new sauce I've never cooked or some new um, carb I've never cooked that's healthier than mashed did, potatoes. <laughs> did you know that the non-HelloFresh meals that you started making are better? Did you know that? Oh, I'm sure. I, I mean, I've... You know, instead of putting two ingredients, I put 10. Yeah. Yeah. But it's actually really good now. Yeah. Not that it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like it's, I feel like more than anything, it has been six months of cooking class for me, you know. And son, um, you know how you were picky about your food before when people give you food? Yep. So what happens now when, when you're given food? I eat it. Why? Because I learned my lesson. Cooking's not easy, huh? Yeah. Again, that was all real. That's how she really feels. That's how my son really feels. And the promo code is NDQ30, HelloFresh.com, promo code NDQ30. We're super pumped that they chose to support No Dumb Questions. Back to the show. What'd you think about the video? Well, first, I got to know if you've tried the white sauce. Oh, dude, white sauce is a regional thing. So I've lived all over the South. You know, I've lived in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia. No joke, about every 50 miles the type of barbecue changes. Like in the Chattanooga area, they do shaved uh, barbecue. You know, in this area where I live, about 50 miles from where I'm at, white sauce is the thing. And you put it on poultry, mm. like turkey or chicken. And I'm really looking forward to when you come to Alabama, you get to try it. It's a just a regional I'll thing. I'll try it. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, we, we don't do that here. My favorite barbecue place near where I live in western Wyoming, no kidding, is served out of a chuck wagon and then you go sit in an old Civil War era tent at a <laughs> at a table with old like cranky prospector pots and pans decorating the tent. That's awesome. There's a fire in a pot belly stove in the tent in case it gets cold. That is amazing. What what did you think about the yeah. video, man? Well, I really liked the video in terms of the way they paced it. I thought it was fun. It made it feel like instead of using these people to tell a story and make a political point. They were kind to people who needed kindness and enjoyed really good food and swap stories. I loved the way they paced it. It was smart. It was apolitical. It was very human. The thing I like most about it is that I feel like I sat down and had a meal with some people from North Korea. I mean, this isn't a mind-blowing video, right? There's nothing amazing that happens or anything like that, but I just get to peek into the minds of these people that lived in North Korea for just a little bit. And not just through their words, <clears throat> sweater guy lets you peek into his mind because he can't contain his excitement and reactions to the food. I liked Sweater Guy. Sweater best. Guy was my favorite, no doubt. Did you see the one person that said eating meat is enough to get you executed? Or kill, what do they say? Killing a cow is enough to get you executed? Yeah. 
Get none of that as a surprise to me. Look, there are some ideas that I study from the history of the world and I think, oh, that was an okay idea, or mm, that's not really a great idea, but I could see why you would think it at that moment. And then there's communism. It might be my least favorite idea of all the ideas in terms of politics and philosophy. I can't hide my disdain for the concept that one person would have such a better view for how the world ought to be that they should take ownership of everyone else and all their stuff. It's just slavery across the board. Instead of having a slave class and a not slave class in the name of equality, you just make everybody a slave and subject to the whims of whatever crazy stuff the ruling class becomes into. There's a cruel irony in communism because it's, it's all held out as being this solution to inequality And it does create equality, just horrible equality for everyone who lives under that rule. I'm I'm not a fan. No, it turned my stomach to hear them talking about how things were in their experience there. You? This is part of what I call the North Korea problem. You've got these people that live on the other side of that border at the DMZ, right? They don't know what it's like to have a birthday party and serve people hamburgers. I mean, not that they would serve hamburgers, but they don't know the basic things like having a full belly on food that you got to choose. So you would just sit over here and not do anything. Is that what we do? I think there are things we can do. My problem is that every time, or so often, when we say, ah, a really bad thing is happening, and people have to live under a regime we don't like, let's send people and spend money and shed blood to go and make it better, it doesn't get better. It opens up situations so that more things like that can happen. You don't have to shed blood to fix the North Korea problem. What do you do? What would be your solution if without shedding blood? First of all, I would be active. I would actively try to get information into North Korea about what the rest of the world is like. I wouldn't sit over here at home and, you know, just be happy about it. You know, me as if I was a leader of a nation and I had the ability to influence global politics, I would say, okay, we're going to allocate some money towards getting information into North Korea. Okay, cool. So part one of the plan is get information there. Just just present a different vision for how the world could look to the people of North Korea. Yeah. Cool. I like it. How would you do it? I would do several things. I would send balloons up that would go drop into North Korea. Not even joking. I would do something like that. Set up radio transmitters on the border, blasting into North Korea. Do you know why that won't work? Because they don't have radios. They do have radios, but they are government-issued radios, and they can only be tuned to government frequencies, altering a radio, punishable by death. Is it really? That is what I read. I've never been to North Korea. So the answer is just sit around and just let it happen? No, I'm not saying that. I, I just want to vet, I want to vet your plan because I really like that suggestion. Okay. I just think it's a tricky thing. And when you have a regime who's willing to kill people for looking at the wrong picture, you got to be really smart about how you do it, or in an effort to do a favor, you're actually really hurting people. Okay, you know about Stuxnet? Mm-mm. Okay, you know Iran's working on a nuclear bomb, right? Yeah. Okay, there was a computer virus dropped into their facility that was refining uranium for nuclear weaponry. It was a genius of a program because you can read all this on the internet. Apparently, the motor controllers that they were using to, to spin up the material to refine the uranium, they figured out a way to throw some thumb drives or something on the street in Iran that made its way into the facility. So what that means is this computer virus jumped multiple hardware devices until it eventually got to a motor controller. So somehow they made a, a virus that could do that. Once it got in there, it as they were trying to refine the uranium, it did it in such a way that it would mess up the batch that they were working on so they couldn't actually refine it. That's genius. It is. It's active espionage, actively trying to thwart the plans of the enemy. So would you do that? Yes. So part one would be try to get info there. My pushback on that would be, one, it's very risky for the people who are receiving it. And two, I think those people have a suspicion that life could be better. But I think that could be effective if we found a way to do it smartly so we weren't putting people at risk. Proposal number two would have fit better in the last episode, 007. You would go MI6 on them. Yeah, totally. What would you do? Here's the thing. I think the better idea will win. And that idea is very bad. And sometimes when we ham-fistedly try to solve other people's problems, either in our own relationships or internationally, we do help other people solve their problems. And sometimes we make things worse. 
And foreign policy is not as simple as what I hear on the internet. Here's what, here's what I'd like to do if you're cool with this. Sure. I want to tell you about one of those moments where it, it almost got to war over something really, really small and it almost just exploded. It's called the Axe Murder inc- Incident. Have you ever heard of this? No, but I love the name. Have you ever heard of Operation Paul Bunyan? What? That's a thing? It's a thing. Operation Paul Bunyan. I'll tell you about it in a second. Um, first, I want to get back to the barbecue thing for a second, because Please. every time I've ever hung out with you and we have went to eat, I've been uncomfortable with how we eat. You eat only meat, pretty much, right? I am primarily a carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see why that's bad. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, only meat. You eat only meat, Matt. Mm-hmm. You are more picky with food than my children are. What? Yeah, no joke. We go to, we go to order at a restaurant, it's easier to order for my children than it is to order for you. Well, yeah, because you're in control of them and their brains don't need to have any (laughs) volitional investment in what they eat. You can just dictate to them. Whereas I have a very complex process for deciding what I want. This is what I want to do. And and this is just me, man. So I like to disagree with you because we're friends and we're buddies, right? And there's this other guy that I really like to disagree with as well. In fact, he's probably one of my favorite people to disagree with because we disagree on so many different things in our lives, but we're really good friends, okay? I want to get both of you guys together here for just a second. He doesn't know what we're going to talk about. You don't know what we're going to talk about, but I do want to talk about (laughs) just your dietary things. Are you cool with that? This is, yeah, this is a recipe for awesome. I know, it is. And so I just want to briefly have that conversation. And I also, after we do that, I want to talk tell you about Operation Paul Bunyan. Are you cool with this? Yes, this is fun. Let's do it. I, I don't know what's coming. Okay. Just so everybody gets that. That makes it more fun. Okay, cool. Okay, here's the deal. Matt, I'd like you to meet Henry from Minute Physics. Hello. Hi, Henry from Minute Physics. How are you doing? Doing great. Where are you at? Missoula. Oh, I lived there. I know the place. Nice, nice. Where are you in my in Wyoming? Western Wyoming, well, Lander, Wyoming, getting toward National Park territory. Gotcha, gotcha. So we're just, you know, like seven or eight hours apart. (laughs) Okay, so here's the deal, Matt. So Henry is probably my favorite person in the world to disagree with. Henry, we like to disagree. Would you agree? We do like to disagree. We also like to agree on a lot of things, but we we disagree on a number of things. We do. But but the cool thing about it, is uh, I think it's all thoughtful disagreement. We spend a lot of time talking to each other and all that kind of stuff. It's just really fun. Henry, I, you you texted me about my my most recent video, and I told <laughs> you that you could get on to me right here. Would you like to go ahead and do that? Sure. I'm just gonna th- I'm just throwing your own words back at you, but you have any number of times I remember in the distant past. I don't even know if if this still exists, but there's a YouTube channel called FPS Russia, which is essentially just a guy shooting big guns and making big explosions with not any like regard for demonstrating safety in any way or explaining anything or any anything other than that it's just entirely gratuitous guns and explosions that you have in the past i would i would say complained about to me uh as being not particularly representative of what you think would be respectful use of uh of weapons and firearms and I, I just couldn't help but notice that you had in your most recent uh, Prince Rupert Strap video a moment where you're like, I'm just going to blow it up because because it's fun. And it seemed a little bit undestined to me. You definitely you definitely still did all the gun safety stuff. It occurred to me that the Prince Rupert's Drops are becoming more and more about guns and less and less about Prince Rupert's Drops. You have a valid point, Henry. So So let me defend myself. So... This is what I wanted to do. I had a massive Prince Trooper's drop. Did you see how big that thing was? I did. I think that you were really dis- I was really disappointed. I imagine you were really disappointed that the explosion covered everything up and you couldn't see anything that happened to it. I was very disappointed. I was disappointed because I didn't set the exposure of the camera correctly. What I wanted to know is I tried a, a thing a long time ago where I would line up Prince Rupert's drops and I would fire one by breaking the tail and i tied the bulb of one to the tail of the next one i tried to make a domino oh nice train out of prince rupert's drops never could get it to work and so i thought that meant that prince rupert's drops were really strong from external forces you know as long as it's not 
actively breaking the tail. And so mm-hmm. I really was wanting to know if an external blast would break the uh, Prince Rupert's drop. I did it, and I was disappointed for all the reasons that you explain. You know, it wasn't exposed correctly. You know, my time scale wasn't right. I couldn't measure everything I was trying to do. But it was still really cool and fun. And um, and so I was left with this, well, heck, there's really nothing I can show or demonstrate that I learned from this other than all the stuff I did bad. But it's still really interesting, you know, because yeah. I filmed it from so many angles. So I decided to use it. So I accept your criticism, <laughs> and um, and you're absolutely correct. All right, so we are gathered here today. Um, Henry, this isn't going to be a very long section. We're, we're talking about North Korea, and we're talking about what to do with them and or what not to do with them, blah, blah, blah. We just watched this video about people from North Korea trying American barbecue for the first time. So you, more than anybody else in my life, have, have made me really think about what I eat and why I eat it. Because when we've been at you know, all these trips together, you make me think about food because you don't eat meat correct that is correct for the most part okay but it hasn't it hasn't I see always what been you're that. doing <laughs> <laughs> what, what what do you say what, what do you mean matt are, are you being oh, are you I, realizing I what like, you've gotten into here matt i'm starting to get on <laughs> i think it's going to be fun but it's just it's such a bummer because mine is the whatever position which means that i won't feel any disappointment with someone who only eats leaves but I know that someone who only eats leaves is going to feel tremendous disappointment with my choices. No, so no, my, no. My shoulders are already slumping. <laughs> no, no. I, I don't... Th- this is my point. I already accept that, Matt, you eat very different. Henry, just to bring you up to speed, Matt pretty much only eats meat. He's the most carnivorous person I've ever met in my entire life. Right. I have remarkable canines. They would impress you. But so I have a question for you. Are you like... Being a a Wyoming carnivore, does that mean you're just like going out and hunting elk and and pronghorn and that's what you're eating? Yeah, I just stab whatever walks through my yard. (laughs) No, I'm serious though. Like this is like, this is a big thing, right? Here in, here in, in, in Montana is like people, I know people who go out and they hunt their elk for the year and they eat a lot of meat, but they never go to the grocery store and buy like feedlot cattle. They're, they're like going out and they hunt an animal and they bring it home and that's, that provides for their family for a year. Yep. That's how we do it here. Tons right. of that. There's also a lot of locally raised beef. So that's right. a huge thing as well. But I, I can see elk all winter long out the front window of my house. Me too, basically. So, so this is the thing, Matt. So Henry has very unique, interesting reasons why he doesn't eat meat. And in the interest of what you and I like to do, which is always make sure that we're hearing every side of every argument, um, Henry really kind of changed my mind about food. And so I'm act- Henry, I'm, I'm not going to tell you I'm doing this yet, but I've been thinking about doing a short period of time where I eat only vegetables, but I want to share an experience with you. I decided to give up a certain type of meat for a certain amount of time recently, just kind of dry run it. Uh huh. And I kind of felt like a, uh, a snob to be honest with you, because <laughs> there was a moment in time when I ordered some lasagna, like they had two types of lasagna, like a veggie lasagna and one with meat. Yep. And she brought the one with meat to my table. And I was several days into this particular diet I was doing, and the meat was on my table. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I I needed needed the veggie one because of, you know, my principles or whatever. And I felt so ashamed when she picked that plate up and took it away from me. And I'm like, well, she's going to bring me a veggie one, but it's going to have a big loogie in it. You know what I I mean? Well, But, But I felt ashamed. It was almost like, well, your food is not good enough for me. There's, there's two things there that are going on. One is like the decision of eating something that's maybe not as typically on the menu or, you know, not what is culturally appropriate or, nor- or normal. So I totally get that. The reason that I am vegetarian at this point is largely because of um, the kind of environmental and, and energy uh, impacts of meat and other kind of high intensive production um, foods, right? So whether it's meat or whether it's corn that has huge amounts of fertilizer put on it that are derived from petroleum products, um, those sorts of things. Meat in particular is incredibly energy intensive because it takes something on the order of like beef, for example, takes something on the order of 20 calories of corn, I think, for about one calorie of beef, right? So you could feed 20 people with corn or one person with beef is the example, right? Because you need to feed the cow the corn in order for it to grow. 
I, I consider myself much more like a, a pragmatic uh, vegetarian in the sense that when this happens and I, this, what your experience has happened to me, this, when this happens to me, I say, okay, so my options are either send this food back and have it be pretty much a hundred percent wasted and, and destroyed and like not fulfill the purpose of food, which is to feed people. Or I can choose to eat it and, you know, understand that under, I understand that the calculus has changed, right? The math has changed at this point of like, we are no longer in the situation of like eating meat is, is going to be, you know, harmful to environmental and energy costs. Like at that, once that, once that meat dish is on your, is on your table in front of you at a restaurant, it is now harmful to send it back in from that perspective. Right. So, so what do you do in that situation? In that situation, I eat I eat whatever they brought. If you can reduce how much food that you know is thrown in the trash because of your actions in some way, you're increasing the efficiency of your you know you're saving money, you're saving uh, fuel and energy that our country then can devote to other things, right? Like we spend a huge amount of resources on on making food, and you know we could save those and use them for other things. Okay, I'm gonna have to have a sidebar with Matt for a second, Henry. All right. You just can 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 you just like be here but not be here for just a second? <laughs> sure. Matt, is this not the, the the most foreign thing compared to the way? We- <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what's not foreign about it. It's principled, what? and I respect yeah. the principled part. I guess I just have slightly different principles, but I also get that we're all trying to live in ways that. I don't know, further the things that we really feel convicted about. So even though I don't like vegetables that much, I enormously respect this. Are we really going to pretend like he's not in on this conversation? No, we're not. I was wondering what he's going to say. So the thing is no, that... Like, I, I'm going to be quiet and just let you ask questions because I remember Henry and I had a huge discussion about this and, and I I still eat meat and I still love it. He's a very open-minded person and um, you know he's very courteous and... It's fascinating. I would love to hear the questions you would have for this. Well, I'm fascinated too. So obviously you feel strongly enough about it to have change start with you, which is awesome and exactly how it should work. Do you find yourself gravitating toward other people who have the same convictions or when you go out to eat, is it pretty diverse? Um, so, I mean, the first thing is that I don't go out, go out to eat very often. Uh, one of the reasons that I think kind of started this the slippery slope if you want to call it that was that because i like to cook for myself a lot it turns out that i really am not a big fan of cooking meat right like if somebody else cooks the meat i'm much happier but i don't like dealing with the mess myself right i find it to be slimy and and smelly and you have to be more oh. careful about sanitation and like you know it's it's a lot easier to just like chop up some onions and and you know than to than to to dress a an animal so meat, you're saying the meat doesn't gross you out, no, especially like if your out. mom cooks it for you. The meat that I, so the meat that I end up, that I will eat, if I catch a fish and clean it, I'll eat it. I think one thing that's, that people might be surprised to hear is that, you know, I'm a vegetarian and yet I had no problem. Last Thanksgiving, I went to my girlfriend's family's farm in Massachusetts and helped them slaughter 70 turkeys for the Thanksgiving, you know, turkeys for the town. That that doesn't surprise me because it doesn't sound like what you're describing is like a religious prohibition. To me, it sounds like a, a principled extension of okay. Well, if I believe these things about how I think the world ought to work, I should do those things. Right. Right. It's very pragmatic, and I feel like you know, if I with this this pragmatic view, you know, if I went a hundred years back in time, I wouldn't really have, or two hundred years back in time, I wouldn't have nearly as much concern about meat. the The big concern really is kind of the environmental. An energy impact. How many gallons of gasoline are we spending making this pound of beef or how many, how much corn that could have been used to feed people is being used to make that pound of beef? Uh, and then also how much, you know, toxic sludgy waste runoff from feedlots is it producing? How much overgrazing and erosion and soil blowing off and we're losing, you know, farmland, all these sorts of things that are, that are kind of going to be bigger concerns in the near future or the immediate future or the long-term future for how, how, you know, we as a species are able to survive on this planet. This is fun, man. Thanks for jumping on with us. No problem. It's fun to, fun to join in. Yeah. I literally feel 0% judged too. So it's nice to have the ability to have the conversation 
And especially as I think about it, like your graciousness on it is really helpful because I know I'm wrong on this point, at least as it pertains to my health and what I ought to be doing. And I appreciate you not completely shaming me. So thank you. Cause sometimes I talk with people who eat how you eat and I definitely feel shamed. We're all human, right? Uh, so this is, this is kind of what I was thinking, Henry, like I'm not going to become a vegetarian. It's not going to happen, but it's something I'm interested in doing for a couple of reasons. One, if I'm completely honest is to show you respect because I respect our relationship. I don't think it's okay for me to just firmly disagree with you until I walk towards your side of the aisle a little bit so I can understand fully where you're coming from. You know what I mean? Yeah. I appreciate it. Not just, not just because you're walking towards my side of the aisle, but like that perspective in general, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I mean, and you have the same way with me. We've been that way forever. And, uh, and, and yeah. And so that's why, and also I'm a little bit curious because I didn't eat beef for a little while and that that one moment when they brought the uh, lasagna to the table and it had you know beef in it, I felt all kinds of social things that I'd never even considered, and so yeah, I kind of want to do the walk a mile in Henry's shoes thing <laughs> and just see what it's like, just so I can understand you better. Well, uh, well, dude, I can't tell you how uh, how fun this was for me. Is it, no kidding. Matt, you got any? You got any more questions, Matt? Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. We we can be good, but man, I. I really enjoyed it, and it was well-timed. I did not know this conversation was coming. And just this weekend, with the whole hospital thing, Mm -hmm. I've had to mentally confront the idea of going on this weird diet. So it's providentially timed. This is fun. Well, good luck with that, and I hope your uh, daughter's surgery goes well as well. Thanks. She's getting better. I'm I'm encouraged. Great. I appreciate it, Henry. We'll let you go, man. All right. Talk to you later, guys. Bye. Okay, should, should we steer this back to North Korea now? Yeah, we had talked about your plan to make it better. And to review, you had thrown out, get info there, good idea, do it carefully. Espionage, you give a couple of fun examples, I like that. When would be your line in the sand point for when you'd say, man, we just got to go in there and fix it with force? Would you be up for that? So let me explain something that happened Um <laughs> that you may not have heard of. It's called Operation Paul Bunyan. Okay. Oh, that's right. You teased that. Yes. Yes. Tell me. Yeah. So you talk about the moment, like the straw that breaks the camel's back. Well, there was this moment in history at the demilitarized zone where it all went south. My buddy Jared told me about this. And so there was this tree that was set up in this one spot where the South was trying to look across the border to keep an eye on certain things going on in the North. And this one tree was in a bad spot in the DMZ. And so they sent a team of people out to chop down the tree with axes. Like they call this, they were going to trim it or whatever. But they went out there to do this. There's a whole Wikipedia article that we'll link in the show notes called The Axe Murder Incident or The Tree Trimming Incident, Operation Paul Bunyan. They go out there to cut this tree down and they were attacked by a guard on the North Korean side. And they were all just killed. Whoa. Killed because of this tree. So what do you think happened from there? I have no idea. That could go a lot of different ways. This was the moment that broke the camel's back. These these people, there was an American. Uh, let me get this right here. Let me look at this article. Uh, pull it up. Axe murder incident on Wikipedia. Okay. Oh, so these weren't South Koreans. These were Americans who went out to cut the thing down? Well, there were two Americans with some South Koreans, and the Americans were not armed. There was a lieutenant. They weren't armed, and when they got out there to trim the tree, 15 North Koreans showed up, and then it just all went south, and they just just killed them. Wow. You're not going to cut this tree down. This is a very strategic tree. You cannot cut this tree down. This is the line in the sand. Hmm. So once that happened, everything went crazy. On both sides. And so there was there was this huge escalation in force, and we almost went to war over this one tree. Is it over that one tree, or is that tree a metaphor for something much bigger, though? Yeah, come on, it wasn't over that tree. That I mean, that's the spark that ignites a, a very long, complex series of decisions that led us to a place where a tree would be that big of a deal. Well, at some point, you have to make a decision, right? And so when we're sitting here talking about North Korea 
and you're saying, oh, well, they can't actually, their missiles don't actually do anything. Well, if they do something next week, is that going to change your opinion? Or are you just going to move your line one step down the road? Here's the thing. Here's why I'm against the death penalty, and I am answering your question. I'm against the death penalty because you can't give life back, and there's no degree of certainty that I could have where I would say I'm willing to take the risk that I'm wrongly participating in killing someone in a death penalty situation. So in other words, I, I'm just, I don't want that blood on my hands. I'm not up for that. I'm up for locking somebody in a cage forever because of something we're really sure they did. But I just don't want to kill him. And the money I have to kick in to keep that person alive is money that I'm paying for a slightly less dirty conscience. In the same way, if we do the preemptive war thing, which I don't think played very well for us in the last decade in the Middle East, if we do the thing where we say we're pretty sure they're about to do something really bad and then we go and shed blood, well, we're the only ones who actually started shedding blood. And that makes me very hesitant. It's part of the reason that I've never been on Team America with the bombings at the end of World War II. I always hear, well, Japan would have fought to the last man and we had to do it. Really? Do we? I, they might have said that, but really? So, we, I mean, because we killed a ton of civilians in the process of doing that. Everybody's worried about nuclear weapons, but we're the only ones who ever actually used them. I don't like that justification for that level of bloodshed. And so... I'm the kind of guy who would rather stand around and wait to get punched before I punch somebody else. And I'm hesitant to say, well, I really think they're probably going to do something. So let's intervene militarily, especially if we're talking about intervening in a way militarily that actively takes lives. Okay, so during Operation Paul Bunyan, the North Koreans killed these people that were trying to cut this tree down. They punched right. first. Okay, yep. at that point, what happens? What happened in history? Well, they did a no, 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 no. What happens? They cut the tree down anyway. Well, what happens if you're punched? Do you respond, or do you not? Well, I like the way they did respond. The way they responded did not result in a war, so I agree with their response. They did respond. They didn't respond, but with guns and shooting at people and giant open warfare. So peace through superior firepower. I'm good with that. Cool. All right. And think about that. That's that's what the mid 1970s that that happened. Mm -hmm. That's height of the Cold War. I don't think anybody wanted to light that spark. And so just walking out there and saying, we're cutting this tree down. And if you want to start World War III over that, you may. But we're going to cut this down and then we're going to leave. Seems like a reasonable response to me. And what I just read is that North Korea even owned it. I know of two incidents where North Korea said, yeah, that happened and we own responsibility for that. So. Even though we view the other side as usually this bad guy, bad guys still don't like to get killed. And so there's always that check on almost any enemy we come across, except maybe ISIS. And that check is they don't want to die either. They don't want to roll the dice on them or people they love getting killed. And I think you can leverage that a lot further than sometimes people think for peace, in the interest of peace. So I have a question for you. Hmm. Bring it. I watched a video... Uh, a couple days ago, of my friend's daughter launching like Estes model rockets. You remember those? They shoot yeah. off the stick and they go up and they have the parachute. And it, and it was it was fun and it was very um, <laughs> it was a good reminder of just how erratic that process was because the thing went off all in weird directions. So, what actually has to happen to go from a rocket that goes in the air somewhere to a rocket that we should actually be afraid of? like what North Korea is trying to develop. What's the technology? There's a book. I think I have it. Is a book in the room? I have I have this book that I, I got from my, it, it was at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency where Granddaddy worked before it was Marshall, and it's like an antique book. And it, it had to do with the guidance of a missile. Have you ever thought about that? Like the guidance part, the brain? All I've thought about is that I don't understand it at all. Really? Okay. It, yeah, so, I'm curious about it. I mean, I've always wondered, but... Wouldn't have the first guess. Okay, so first of all, if you want to fire a missile, um, you have to have some way of controlling it. That's the first thing. And so you can, sometimes you can gimbal the nozzles at the bottom of the rocket. Sometimes you can use control surfaces, we call them. What does gimbal mean? Gimbal means uh, move it around. Like like if you were to hold your, your arm solid, you can gimbal your, your wrist around. You can move it in more than one 
angle. You can tilt it around. Uh, like kind of like a ball 80s joint. G.I. Joe action figures versus 80s Star Wars action figures. I think so. <laughs> Trust me, it's right. <laughs> okay, good. So, you know, you can you can move around and, and change the thrust axis going through the body of, of the missile, basically. And so that is one way to control this thrust vector controlling. You can do things like that. You can have fins on the side and control those. Man, I was looking at the SpaceX return to the launch point today. Have you watched any of that? Mm-mm. Today's launch was amazing because they were able to track it all the way up to stage separation. And then it does the 180 and it burns and comes back. It's the first time I've seen them track the whole way. The people at Kennedy Space Center did a great job getting that footage. Anyway, so you have to be able to control where it moves and you control the forces on that. But the real trick is knowing where it needs to go. And now we have GPS, and it's pretty easy to use GPS to figure out where you want your bombs to go or your your rocket that's got an astronaut in it or whatever. But back in the day, they didn't have GPS. And so there's two systems that I think is really cool from back in the day. One of them was, do you know about the Earth's magnetic field? Other than north is where a compass points. I've seen pictures of it. Was it like the concentric arcs coming out from the poles? Yeah, it's even more different than that. So you can take a compass, and where you're at, the compass doesn't point to the North Pole. Where does it point? Um, There's something called magnetic declination. Are you saying it points to the magnetic North Pole, or that it doesn't even point to the magnetic North Pole? It points to the magnetic North Pole, which moves around. And so, okay, sure. I'm sorry, this was a, a very roundabout way of saying this. Back in the 50s, the government mapped... You know, where the compass would point everywhere in the world. They also mapped local disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field, and this would change. And so back in the day, they would program rockets to be able to go all the way across wherever they were going, ICBMs, using things like a compass, but also understanding how that changed on the Earth as you moved. And so every year they had to figure out how to update these, you know, it's like a chart and it's locally updated. And so they used to have to program the missiles before they were fired so they would know what they were flying through. And so they could, you know, check themselves along the way to see if they were doing it right. That was really, really cool. Yeah, that's one way they used to do it. The Pershing-2 missile, which was the missile that pretty much ended the Cold War, that's the ones we parked in Germany that could hit Moscow. Oh, yeah. They used optical guidance methods, so they would program in targets with these little cassette decks, and they would, this is my understanding, talking to an old Pershing 2 engineer, they would program it in so it knew where it was going by, like, Google Maps version 1980. I thought that was pretty cool. Really? That's what they did. Yeah. So how how accurate was that technology? Oh, man. Pershing 2, they could just take out an outhouse. It was amazing. Did we ever actually use Pershing 2s in combat? No, we didn't. We just showed we just showed the the communists that we could. So we definitely know they worked. They weren't just a clever trick oh, yeah. with big Estes rockets. Yeah, they definitely worked. And so the way it worked during the Cold War, the Russians worked on big bombs, like make it bigger and scarier. And the Americans worked on miniaturizing the bombs and make them smaller, more nimble. But put them on top of a rocket that could drive a tack all the way across the world. Those were the two different strategies. I don't know if if you want to say one one versus the other, but it's just two different ways to skin the cat. I think winning there was a lot more complicated, but yeah, obviously small and nimble seems to win a lot in history when it comes to military technology. I think so. And I'm so a big fan of small and nimble. <laughs> what? 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 So right now, what this guy's doing, I don't know, in North Korea. He's just making rockets that can try to hit things as far away as possible. This stuff is hard, man. The world is complicated. I think Woodrow Wilson made some point during World War I about a normal person from one part of the world and a normal person from another part of the world. They would never try to kill each other. It doesn't make sense. It's not worth the risk. I mean, you're talking about a coin flip on whether or not you live or you die. So they'd be hesitant to do that. But leaders are properly or sufficiently detached from that risk that they're coin flipping with other people and with other people's money 
and with other people's stuff. And they know that other leaders will have kind of a gentleman's agreement with them, you know, if they're defeated. And so ultimately it won't cost them probably their lives. And so Wilson was saying, you know, let's make this League of Nations thing, which ultimately didn't work out, but it was a predecessor to the United Nations as a way to make World War I the war that ends all wars. We'll get everybody to the table together and we'll try to bypass this, you know, leaderly divide and make it more like people talking to people. And then we'll be more hesitant to kill each other. And the U.S. didn't even end up signing up for the League of Nations. And the U.N. has been, I don't know, the mixed result in terms of making that happen. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I think the key to all this is getting everybody at the table and eating some barbecue together. I think yeah, I was going to say the key to all of this is going to a pourable, pourable diet. So <laughs> we're, we're both close. Unless Henry's there and then I'll eat vegetables. <laughs> that'd be another thing. That'd be well. nice. You know, I think you're right. I mean, you're being a little tongue in cheek, but I think you mean that, right? I do. I really understand after that conversation with Henry, I understand the verses in the Bible that talk about eating meat and don't eat meat if it offends your brother. Oh, that's, yeah, those are confusing. They are, because they're they're talking about, you know, these meats that have been sacrificed to idols. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's a totally different thing, but it doesn't really matter, right? Like, if meat offends somebody, then it's best not to eat it around them. Well, you, what you're doing is you're just making a conversational gesture. Did you know that the first all-church council in the history of Christianity actually was over that issue that you just brought up. Really? Yep. The first church council is the only one that's actually recorded in the Bible. In Acts 15, a Syrian church, modern day Syrian church is in a kind of a quarrel with the home church in Jerusalem. And they're having issues because they can't sit down and eat meals together. The, the more traditional conservative Jewish Christians aren't working real well with the more Greek liberal Christians who live up in Antioch. So they can't sit at the same table. They're having fights. feels like the thing is falling apart. So Peter, Paul, and James, among others, get together and they, they arrive at this conclusion that there, there are just a few things that we're going to ask people not to do. And so they write a letter to the Antioch, more liberal Christians, and say, hey, if you could you know, avoid this kind of food... And avoid this thing. And also, could you please not eat meat from strangled animals? That'd be awesome. And that was it. And and the whole point was, let's put the conversation back together because we're better together than we are apart. And I think we can overlook some of these differences if we just agree to some ground rules voluntarily. And it it was really, really effective. Hmm. I think it's a good thing. I think there's lessons to be learned there, even if you're not a Christian. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, the principle is universal. The idea of voluntarily laying down something you're completely entitled to do in the interest of something bigger than yourself or showing concern to someone who maybe even is your enemy, that's a huge principle. And if you do that, then you're right. You do get to the table. Because I I will admit, I have had violent thoughts toward people in my life. I'm sure as a kid, I did. And I can think of a few times where I've been so angry about something I've seen an atrocity in another country that I've thought, I hope that person dies. But I have never thought that about somebody I've been sitting at a meal with. People have irritated me at meals. I've certainly irritated people at meals, mostly with my overwhelming crippling flatulence. But I have <laughs> never gotten to a point where I, I just felt like... I thought you said one of your superpowers is that it was odorless. Yeah, I was just trying to make stuff up, dude. Like, I, I don't know, I thought it would play well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, and it's very effective that way, which is maybe okay. why I feel so candid just breaking that out really in any social <laughs> environment. When you're around people, you see their humanity. And even if they annoy you, you can still tell they're like you in some way. And I feel like that element isn't just what is out of the equation on this conversation about North Korea. I feel like that element is breaking down a little bit, even you know, in our own country, in our own communities, in the West in general. It's becoming so angrily tribal that You can't sit down and have that meal and have a sane conversation and see the humanity of someone who views stuff different. It's going to be really hard for this to end well if we can't pull that off. I am super pumped about Emily Grassley's new podcast. I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm I'm just going to say it. It's called Divides Aside. 
and the whole point of it is two people that have completely different views sitting down and uh, and talking, and it's all about religion. You know, she's the atheist at the conversation, and uh, the guy named David is the other guy, and they just man, it's great. It's excellent. It was captivating for me. You know, I I listened through and found points of commonality with both Emily and David. I found myself disagreeing at times as well, but it couldn't stick in my craw and I couldn't get grumpy and get on my little mental soapbox because the very act of having the show was such a gesture of conversational grace. It's very disarming and smart, really smart. And ballsy. It's very ballsy. They're very vulnerable with each other. It was excellent. I hope that thing thrives. I do too. We should see if we can get Emily to come on. Yeah, you want to? Yep. Let's do it. Hey, in addition to HelloFresh, this incredibly somber episode of No Dumb Questions is also brought to you by you, because a ton of you are sponsoring us on Patreon, and that is the most honest, direct way to say, here is content that I want and have fun with, and I want it to keep happening, so I'm going to throw a little bit of money at the thing. It means a ton, and it's been fun getting to know some people over that direction, so if you like what's going on and you feel like being a part in that way, you can go to patreon.com slash no dumb questions and support us that way. If you don't, I'm still really glad you're here and it's cool. Back to the show. Hey, Matt, before you go back to the show, I just did the math. It's not a ton of people that support us. It is about 28.3 tons of people. <laughs> How many? <laughs> did you actually type that in? Did you? I did the math. I did the math. 315. <laughs> You average about 180 pounds per person, right? Of course you And then did. divide that by 2,000, 1, 2, 3. That is 28.35 tons of people are supporting us on Patreon. Did you so, have time to uh, graph that? Because it's not quite no, a destinism she, yet until you've graphed it. Thank you to the 28.35 tons of you that are <laughs> supporting us on Patreon. It really means a lot. There you go, Matt. Fix it with math. No, my, my, my ad was a flaming disaster, and you swooped in and saved it at the last minute. Thank you. No. Thank the patrons, all 28.35 tons of them. Okay, all right. let's, uh, <laughs> let's bring this to the home stretch. Uh, let's do it. We've had let's adventure some weekends. I've done a bunch of fun stuff. I, did I see that you were shooting bullets with your family at things this weekend? I was, and it made a lot of people mad on the internet. I took my what? daughter out. Yeah, I know. I took my daughter out, and I you know, trained her how to use a bolt-action twenty two rifle, awesome. and I apparently irritated all of europe <laughs> oh no was she shooting at people no she wasn't she was getting oh. very good though i was doing little time trials with her at first when we went out there i said you know hey we're gonna learn how to do this and she's like okay i'm scared and i was like no problem and so we worked our way up and by the end of the time that we had together i was handing her a bullet and counting backwards from 10 and by two she was hitting a little bitty milk carton like 50 yards away maybe more like 30 yards away but it was awesome you saw this okay here's my here's my stalker admission i watched those snaps probably five times what aren't they great yeah and thank you did a good job of making it seem like it was something that was fun and not stressful but also you know put just enough pressure on so that you know she wants to improve yeah she got to the point where she's saying daddy i I can't do it when you count i was like i'm sorry i just have to count (laughs) Was, yeah, because life life counts. It was really, yeah, life does count. And we have to do a lot of things while counting is happening. Yeah, it does. Oh, by the way, speaking of things to do with your family, we got our tickets. Oh. Our flights. Are you flying into Riverton? We are for the eclipse. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So, okay, so here's, let me bring people up to speed on this. Uh-huh. There's this big giant eclipse thing, obviously, that's happening. August 21st. So you're going to come out and see an eclipse with me. I am. I'm going to come out there. We've got um, tickets for me and a lot of the family. We're going to fly out there to Riverton. And um, are we are we going to do a thing? Let's announce the thing. We're doing a thing. Say it. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a No Dumb Questions Eclipse event. I work at a church where we have a great big, giant, awesome backyard with trees and a trout stream. And it's really pretty. And so what we're going to do is get the whole thing cleaned up. I was actually working on that yesterday with heavy equipment and everything. So we're trying to make it really nice so it'll be a fun place to camp. And 
we're going to do super cheap camping and some meals and put together a whole eclipse weekend event for the Sunday before the eclipse and then the Monday of the eclipse. And you're showing up for it. So we have at least me and you. And I think that's a great start. I need to I need to be a little bit of a fly in the ointment here. So here's the deal. I don't think it's smart for us all to watch the eclipse together. I don't think we do that. I actually planned watching this eclipse with my buddy Jack from Michigan years and years ago. We said, oh man, 2017, there's an eclipse coming. So no joke, in like 2011, we got you know an agreement, a handshake agreement. So in Alabama, it is now a contract where we were going to go see the eclipse together. Did you spit in your hands first? No, you don't do that. <laughs> I'm really disappointed. What I think makes sense is like we meet together and we hang out like the night before or something. And then Mm -hmm. when it comes time to actually view the eclipse, we need to disperse and everybody go kind of view the eclipse on their own. This is my opinion, but you tell me what we're doing. Yeah, I think I think it needs to be a fend for yourself. If you want to not have to work hard and see it, you can just stay here, uh, you know, at church and watch the thing. If you want to get creative and try and battle your way to a better point of view, you can be clever and do that. But yeah, yeah, I think for the most part, maybe we do a Sunday evening thing with some food. During that Sunday evening thing, what if we like recorded a live version of the podcast? What if we did that? Yes, we should definitely do that. What if we just had like a little get together that night before, the Sunday night before, and we just, you know, recorded a version of the podcast with a bunch of people there live? Yeah. Okay. So we we have no idea how this is going to work yet, right? Well, we just invite the podcast to come to the thing. We probably need to probably need to have tickets or something because we've got a a nice chunk of property here, but Lander is taken up. Everybody's got everything rented out. So we're only going to be able to accommodate what we can fit on our property in terms of tents and and campers. So we better do the math on that. And have like a set number of like camping places kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I looked for hotel stuff there and it's, I mean, people are jacking the prices up all in the uh, the totality plane, all across the states. Like if it's a if it's an Airbnb for that night, it's like a thousand bucks. It's crazy. We don't have to have all the answers right now, right? Maybe we can like discuss it in the subreddit. I hope not. Okay. Yeah, let's make a, a thread in the subreddit, and we'll put something on the website, and we'll just figure it out. Sweet. That sounds good. Oh, speaking of subreddit, there was another thing that came out of the subreddit about the fifty cent pieces. Yeah. Somebody suggested that we give those 50 cent pieces to patrons of a certain level. What do you think about that? Uh, I can think of one patron who definitely deserves one of the awesome 50 cent pieces. Oh, the awesome barrier was broken, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a ridiculous amount per episode, which we both sent the dude an email and we're like, uh, is that a typo, man? (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Did you add a zero on accident? So just a cool dude who likes what's going on and wants to be supportive. I want to and thank that it guy. It means a lot. Yeah. I, I I don't think he wants to be known publicly. Maybe he does. I don't know. But at this point, I'll just say thank you for breaking the awesome level. I appreciate that. I echo this. Cool. So the 50 cent pieces, should we do it? Should we come up with like a certificate or something? Well, let's start by sending one to that dude. Okay. I'll make a certificate. I'll word it cleverly. Let's do it. Did we ever send a prize to whoever won the freakish human skills thing? Uh, I think so. I think. I sent a shirt. Oh, you did it? You're so responsible. I think I did. If I didn't, I'm going to now. It was the guy that could could count on his fingers in binary. So yeah, I think so. This weekend, jumping back a couple points, you did cool stuff with your kids. I got to do cool stuff with my kids. We we had our first super successful day of trout fishing together. My little girl got three brown trout on a spinner and she crushed it. So brave, handling the fish. And these were good size fish. I think we were in the, I think 10 inch was the short and 14 inch was the big brownie. Dang. And so she got three. My little dude who's six got two and I got a rainbow that had been attacked by some sort of bird of prey. Did you get a picture of a it? big gash in the side of it? I did get a picture of it. Yeah. We'll, we'll post it somewhere in the show notes or something. Nice. It, fishing up in the mountains, beautiful Wyoming sunset, no wind, still water. Fish are rising. The snake eating the mouse. I, who cares about your fish? The snake eating the mouse. Okay, no, that's the thing. Okay, so <laughs> I was trying out this other little pond. It's a little yuckier and so forth. And I stepped on this rock 
and a snake comes shooting out from under the rock. This is yesterday, two days ago. So you were on the rock that it came out of? Yes. I, I squished it a little bit, and it wriggled out, and I felt the vibration. And so I jump back. I'm all alarmed and everything, and I'm expecting it to be a, a garter snake or a water snake or whatever, and it looks like a cobra. And I have experience with cobras because I've encountered two of those in Africa. Really? Where at? Yeah, I, I used to work in Zambia. And they had a, a spitting cobra problem on the campus there. What did you do? You killed it, right? Yeah. W- well, some of the students distracted it, and another one ran around a building with a two by four, and uh, it was upright, and he <laughs> played a little t ball, <laughs> which sounds awesome. really okay. And I get it. I know there are a bunch of people right now who are like, ah, oh, the cobras, dude. We okay. need to save the cobras. Was yeah, but the... not when they live with people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna relate to you. I was given the opportunity when I was 14 to harvest an emu, and and for people who don't know, harvest is a nice way of saying murdering with a gun in the head. Yeah, it was amazing because <laughs> my 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 neighbor had an emu farm because that's when everybody in Alabama were gonna make a million dollars raising emus. Emus. God, I really wish I knew how to say this. And um, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, yeah, they. It's a thing. And so anyway, they raised them for their meat. And then for some reason, the market tanked. And this guy was like, well, I guess we need to start eating them. Boys, why don't you go up there and get you one? I said, what? Yeah, go get you one. And so me and my friend, Coulter, we took turns and we played paper, rock, scissors to see who got the first shot. Into a 14-year-old boy, that little head poking around, that's like a dream come true with a 22. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> You know, there are some people who can be above it all and genuinely criticize you saying, gross, and that's why I don't eat meat. Yeah. But all the rest of the people who are thinking how terrible that is but enjoy a good burger, look, somehow the thing has to get dead. Yeah. And a twenty-two to the noggin is a really nice way to do it, all things considered. It, it, so did you hit it on your first try, or did you just fire a couple shots randomly off into the Alabama sky? Well, so... So we, I won paper, rock, scissors. I got to shoot first, but we both agreed that it wasn't fair to shoot right-handed because we're boys raised in the South. We could hit anything with a twenty-two, right? <laughs> so I, I shot left-handed first. So anyway, it, it was killed on the second shot. We'll just say it that way. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so oh, it was good. Anyway, you hit a cobra. We're talking about a snake. I don't know. Where did we go? Right. Okay. So this snake, this is a very important story, and it's been worth every moment and every rabbit trail that goes with it. So this snake comes out from under this rock, and I did a little, I didn't quite do the squeal, but a little, you know, that that double inhale. Yeah. And what threw me off is it had a hood in Wyoming in a (laughs) pond, and it's swimming a couple feet offshore, parallel to the shore. I'm like, what on earth is this? And so I'm trying to get close, but you know, if it's a king cobra... I want to keep my distance. In Wyoming, yeah. And I get close. I'm like, oh, it's eating a mouse. It just ate a mouse. And so it's all flared up in the head. And then I get a little bit closer and I discover it's a trout. This thing, this little snake caught a trout. Dang. And I don't know how it broke it down, but it's got this trout sticking halfway out of its mouth and it's frantically trying to ingest it so it can turn on me. But it couldn't because it's a giant trout. So I got right up next to it and got a couple really good pictures. That's when they're vulnerable, man. Snakes are most most vulnerable when they're eating, right? Yeah, I didn't murder him. I just let him be. We just hung out for a minute. If you do, you need to do it left-handed. I'll tell you that much when he's eating. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, so it was a pretty magical weekend. But here's the other thing we did this weekend, and this relates back to some things that we're talking about here. We went to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Did you go catch that yet? No, no. I want to see it real bad, but I haven't yet. Okay, no, I'm not going to ruin it. But But you saw the first one. Okay, so you get the gist of the whole thing. It's James Gunn is the director and writer, and he really cleverly integrates all of this stuff from uh, the late 70s, early 80s into the movie. Kind of like Ready Player One. Uh, That's exactly where I'm going. Yeah, and I don't mind you getting me there a little bit quicker. Are are we going to do Ready Player One next episode? I think it's time. Yeah, I'm not quite done with this second, or well, I guess now third trip through. I'm over halfway done myself. Yeah. I mean, it's to the point where I'm listening to it because I'm super excited. And so we'll be in the car and I'm like sneaking a headphone in so I can, you know, get a little bit further in the quest. I really like it a lot. And we need to triple down on this claim right now. We still haven't discussed it. We have not. A year ago, we started talking about this and and listening to it at the same time. We've been holding off so that it will be a completely honest first time discussion when we talk about it on the podcast. I'm pumped. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it's hard to hold back right now. Okay, I'm willing to commit to that. Next episode, 
Ready Player One. Game on. We have to we gotta do that before you go to Italy, right? Yeah. And speaking of Italy, okay, well, here's the deal with with the Italy thing. I'm going end of May. Mm-hmm. And some of our Italian audience looked me up and asked if we wanted to do a meetup on one of those days that I'm in Rome. How many people? How many people am I going to meet up with? Yeah. I don't know. At least one. Hold on just one second. Let me do the math real quick. Okay. I'm going to see how many people listen to No Dim Questions in Italy. Here we go. Italy, 2,784 downloads in Italy. That's a lot. That is a lot over the, over the course of this is seven episodes that that's measuring. Yeah, so, so even l- if you divide that out, even that's that's a big chunk. That's like let's just assume three hundred people in Italy. That's a lot of people, dude. Mm-hmm. Man. Mm-hmm. So there's three hundred people in Italy that listen to No Dumb Questions. That's a lot of people, dude. And you're gonna be there. Yeah. So this this is the deal that I made with the listener in Rome. I've got all these people with me who I'm taking on this trip. Really fun, cool people. And so I am asking them to help us find a place that is historically significant, but something that tourists wouldn't just know is there. I don't know anything about Italy, man. I need to go. It's pretty fun. It's, it, it, is my, it is my favorite place outside of this country. Please forgive me, man, but I'm going to have to go. Um, we got to get up tomorrow for school. Cool. Uh, let's do the lightning rundown then on everything here. So the conversation for this episode, as always, is happening on Reddit. How do they get to the subreddit? It's reddit.com slash r slash no dumb questions. Really? You have to type all that stuff? You can do no dumb questions dot reddit.com as well. That'll stick in my brain better. The the iTunes thing has been pretty cool. There's some really fun reviews. People have been clever on there. And we have been gradually filling in the map. So tell us where you're from if you leave a review there, please. Yep. Is that everything? I think that's it, man. This was fun, as always. I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to... Our diet's changing. (laughs) I feel like we've done a tremendous amount to push back on some of the unfortunate stereotypes that people have about Americans and our love of guns and wilderness. (laughs) (laughs) Everything you thought about us, foreign listeners, is completely true. Our bad. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And I think the other thing we learned today on on a more serious note, these are hard questions when you talk about the big world stuff and what to do about other countries' problems and how to interact. And you hope that a degree of social grace will make a difference, but at the same time, I have to concede, it's a hard question, and you did a good job of pinning me down and pointing out that it's a hard question. It was fun, man. We'll catch you soon. All right, buddy. Have a good one, man.